I think a nice place to start might be if you can tell me about the first time you worked on a project where you were able to really um, marry your vision for it with its sort of uh, audio, um, audio visual output through the form of a of a video, and what that felt like for you. It was a really organic process the first time that I sort of combined story and music and sound and audio. Um, and it was with the, the, the short film Leaks um, that was directed by a Métis filmmaker, Kara Mumford. And it was sort of based on an experience that I had had with my daughter, who was at the time five, Minoué, Weibineshi. And we had been with an elder in our territory picking wild leeks. And we had run into a really racist man who uh, yelled kind of horrible things uh, in the car that Minoue was riding in. And it was her first experience with racism. And it was my first experience, I think, as a parent of not being able to protect her from sort of the evils of the world. And she was very, very upset. And I wanted over time to be able to, to talk to her about it and to make sure that she understood that it wasn't her fault and that the shame that she felt wasn't hers, that it was that man's. Um, but she would just cry and cry and there was no room for discussion. And so in sort of talking with, um, with friends and other artists within the indigenous community, it was suggested that I write a, a poem about that experience. Um, and I sent that poem to, to uh, uh, Nishabe and Cree, singer-songwriter Tara Williamson, who wrote the music. We started performing it around Peterborough. Kara asked if she could make a, a video, a music video, or a short film about it. And then she asked if Minoue could be in it. And so a year from, from the time that, that that incident took place, we took this kind of group of Anishinaabe women out to the, the place where we were harvesting wild leeks. We took men away. We danced, we laughed, we told the story, and sort of this communal, um, this communal group of people took, took care of my daughter and, and helped her sort of heal from that. And so that became the, the visual for for leaks, and that was a really powerful experience for me as an artist, um, and also and also for my family, as a way of sort of speaking, having a voice, and speaking back through art. Mm -hmm. I think um, I think what's so beautiful about that process was, you know, it kind of goes through all of these different stages. Like the initial sort of incident happens, but then but then there's this whole moment where where you are also looking to community and, and looking for resources and looking for support. And, and that support happens over a long period of time. Like I think sometimes when something so urgent happens, the, the, the need is to want the action to be just as urgent, but it just it just takes takes time. And in that case, I feel like a year is a really nice, um, a really nice way to kind of mark that with something that's joyous and something that was, uh, that was healing for all. Um, I mean, in that respect, like what role does collaboration play in your work and uh, play in your art? It sounds like a pretty significant one. I think that art making within Anishinaabe context and with indigenous context was always communal. And so everybody was writing songs and carrying songs um, and, and had a voice and was engaged in, in all kinds of sort of creative making processes um, in order to to live in a good way in amongst all of these sort of relationships with living things. So I think creating things was sort of the fabric of Anishinaabe life um, in the times prior to colonialism and, and, and in the times that we've had to resist that as well. Um, I think for me as an academic and as a writer, um, those kinds of pursuits are very, uh, uh, you're very alone, they're very individual, you're in your head for long periods of time creating. And so music for me has been a way of bringing uh, my own voice and my own creative practice in conversation with others. And that's a way of sort of layering meaning, it's a way of um, 
helping the work to travel. It's a way of being able to speak to multiple audiences at the same time. And so that kind of collaborative communal nature of, uh, of visuals and sound and story and lyrics and, and poetry has been something that's, that's been a gift, a gift to me to be able to have the balance of um, in some cases, being being the one that's making all of the decisions um, in writing, or or when I'm working on lyrics, to then figuring out how to bring those lyrics into conversation with other artists, to other voices, to other instruments, and and to sort of almost make a choir where meaning starts to shift and travel. So I think that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm curious what you would describe as some of the foundational um, principles that just guide all of your creative work amongst different mediums. Well, one thing I like about music is that there's, it's, a, it's a durational practice in that you're, you're working with the same material over and over and over again. You're repeating the same sort of, um, you know, melodies or you're, saying this, you're singing the same lyrics over and over again in rehearsal and then in performance. And um, if touring is part of that practice, then you're connecting to audiences in real time and creating these sorts of spaces where you have a lot of power in terms of the kind of energy that's, that's circulating in those spaces. And it's a collaboration between the artists and, and the audience. And I think that uh, repetition in that durational practice is so interesting to me because Inevitably, the hundredth time you perform a song, new meaning sort of pops out to me sometimes. Um, or you, you really get to spend a lot of time with, um, with mistakes or, or with, with things you wish you had, you had edited beforehand. So I think that's something that's really important. I think that collaboration is really important. Figuring out, for me, all of this is about meaning making. And um, it's interesting to try to make meaning um, in real time using different sorts of, of tools and, um, and sounds and visuals and, and intellect and, and seeing uh, people either take that in and, and, and resonate um, and then sort of sort of give something back to the performers as well. Yeah, I like that kind of reciprocal exchange of performance. Absolutely. I, I love the way you, you described um, this sort of ongoing kind of reoccurring role when, when you're working on something. And once you get to the hundredth time you've listened to something, it just, it sort of warps underneath your fingertips and warps underneath your skin. And I find that you know, so often um, it requires a lot of patience to sort of wait for that. I wonder if if that's something you've always you've always known, or something that you had to that that you've noticed sort of changes with each project that you work on. I always ideally like to have sort of a resting period for the project, and because I think um, you get so engulfed, necessarily engulfed in the minutia and in the details. And um, you're listening for certain for certain things and you're hearing certain things or you're reading certain things. And I think it's always really good for me to be able to put the project away for a couple of weeks or a month and then come back to it. And after oftentimes after the two weeks have been spent worrying it to to death and just listen to it with um, with fresh mind and a fresh heart and fresh ears and be able to hear the project as a whole. Um, yeah, I think patience is something that in some ways you always, you always know it, but it's a, it's a practice that you have to continually <laughs> sort of come back to. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, you know, as, as somebody who works among so many different mediums, how do you determine, um, which, which project sort of needs a video or, or it needs a a music video to help to, to help expand its universe and just uh, further its narrative a little bit deeper. Hmm. I think sometimes I let I let the songs choose choose that, and I let artists 
who maybe um, listen to the album and and uh, and then choose the track. So I, I think I do it in maybe an unconventional way. I, I'm not making decisions sort of with a with a label or or based on. Um, maybe based on smart decisions in terms of the business of the music industry. But that's because I'm I'm interested when I think an artist hears something, when a filmmaker listens to a tract and it speaks to them and they get an idea and a light bulb goes off um, and they they can feel like they can bring their creative energy into the project and help that project grow. That's to me what creates amazing visuals. And so letting go of the project a little bit and letting sort of the artistic creative practice lead um, which songs choose which filmmakers has been something that's that's been really important to me. Um, because I think then you get you get somebody who's really excited and who finds the, the sounds generative and that's um, that makes a big difference, I think. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I feel like so much of that um, is built on really nurturing that creative relationship uh, at all times. So, so when you kind of need to work on and execute something, it's really built uh, from from something that's that's really firm and um, something that's had a lot of a lot of effort and, and intention poured into it. Uh, I wonder if you can um, describe your relationship to some of the contributors on Theory of Ice and some of the places that it was recorded and how that kind of contributed to to the overall project? Um, well, I work with my sister, Ansley Simpson, who's a Anishinaabe song, singer-songwriter from Toronto. Um, so we've been sort of collaborating for several decades now on all kinds of, all kinds of things. Um, Nick Ferriero from Peterborough, who's a singer-songwriter. A solo musician in his own right as well is also in the band. Uh, Jonas Bonetta from Evening Hymns was the producer. I also worked with Jim Bryson um, on a couple of songs, and he did some some production as well. Uh, John K. Sampson um, sings a, a duet in Surface Tension uh, with myself. Nadia Meyer, who's an Anishinaabe visual artist, did. Um, provided the artwork for the album cover. There's a short film and video component of Theory of Ice. The first um, video, Viscosity, was released and it was directed by a visual artist from Toronto, Sandra Brewster. And then the, the next series of videos are by a group of really rad Indigenous filmmakers, and so there will be work from Amanda Strong, who's a stop-motion animator that I've worked with before, um, Carolyn Monet, a synergic with Suzanne Kite, and Lisa Jackson. And so I'm really excited about those projects and as, as meaning making projects, as helping the songs and the sounds of this record travel um, to new audiences and to new realms and, and to see where those kind of collaborations go. I'd love to hear from you for this project, why it felt important to have a visual accompaniment for every track and, and what that additional layer sort of added to the project as a whole. I was very lucky in that I had a Canada Council grant um, to support this project, and part of that grant was a visual component. I think that during the pandemic, that visual component became more important because <laughs> um, we haven't been able to play the record or tour the record. And so in thinking through how to help this work travel in the world, that visual component became something that I thought a lot about um, because this this kind of um, the pandemic made the circumstances for releasing work unprecedented and it um, it was tricky to figure out how to reach audiences and how to you know so much work goes into um, making a record I like four years of work went into this record with with so many different people and um, and to not be able to have that release concert or to play a few shows or to go on tour um, was something that was really sad for us. So I think that visual component was something that um, 
I was very privileged and lucky to be able to do with this project, and it and it had an importance. I think during these times that that it um, didn't necessarily have when I first conceived of the project. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I'm I'm really thrilled that you mentioned what was just possible with with the Canadian Council grant, and I feel that for a lot of emerging artists, I mean, something that's really interesting about this particular award is how it tries to really um, thread that relationship between an established artist and somebody that's more emerging. And I think for so many new um, new musicians or directors or just artists working in any medium, it's, it's easy to think that things just sort of happen versus knowing that, you know, it requires a lot of institutional working to just have the resources and funds to be able to execute a vision in the way that you want it to come to life. Yeah, for sure. And for my work, because I'm also an academic and I'm a writer and I do a lot of public speaking, I use these short films in in my teaching and in my speaking. And I, I need them to exist outside of sort of the realm of music video. I need them to exist as short films and I need audiences of, of all kinds of different folks, you know, people who definitely never watch music videos to be able to sort of engage with the work on this level and engage with the album on this level. And so my sort of goals for for making the visuals, I think is different than than a lot of than a lot of musicians. Um, it's sort of part of a bigger project around having these conversations about different indigenous issues, about making sort of particular interventions in terms of representation of, of indigenous women of uh, indigenous queer people um, and of our communities into more mainstream places. And I think that um, it's been really wonderful to sort of be able to travel to different universities and different community centers in the US and Canada and show these videos and have um, people really engage with with the work and see it as a window into thinking and, and discussing um, issues and, and the world in a different way. Um, in your in your music video for Viscosity, I think what's really what's really incredible about that video is the way that it kind of guides the viewer to look at spaces and items that are just a, that are just a little or maybe oftentimes unacknowledged. And I'm curious what your process was for for selecting which images would make it into the video and and, and what kind of captured the eye in that way. So that video was directed by Sandra Brewster. Um, she shot the video uh, during the pandemic. Um, during the pandemic, I was engaged in a letter writing project um, that became a book project called Rehearsals for Living with Robin Maynard, who is the author of Policing Black Lives. And we were writing letters back and forth through the pandemic, through the global uprising for black life about the books we were reading, the things we were participating in. And we were thinking about the land. Um, we were thinking about black land politics. We were thinking about indigenous land politics. We were thinking about how important those wild spaces in the city had become during the pandemic as places of, of refuge. And so, um, Sandra went to the Leslie Spit um, and spent a day with her sister filming, filming the land and filming this this urban refuge for for plants, for animals, and and for people. And um, she made all of the decisions around the images. I sort of loved the black and white. I loved um, that focus on on the intimate. I loved the um, the sort of throwback to the the 1980s video art, and I love that we made that during the pandemic because things were difficult. It was difficult to make things. It was difficult to sort of conceive of music videos with uh, more than yourself, or with a with a location that was more than just your bedroom. So it was it was to me a kind of a a tremendous victory, and it's a really gorgeous piece. Absolutely, yeah. I think I think when you watch the video, you really try to imagine what what was 
what was capturing someone's eye and how that how that fits into the narrative of the song and how both of those things just really work um, work and complement one another. You know, on the most recent album, you you cover a song by Willie Dunn, which is also the the namesake of the award. And I wonder if you can you can tell me about. Uh, the road to you selecting that cover and what it meant for you to include it in this body of work. Well, Willie has is such a phenomenal human and gave so much in terms of activism and and also art. Um, I I had been familiar with his music sort of as a listener um, prior to to performing that song, but my band and I were asked to be part of the Native North America gathering as part of the Megafono Festival in Ottawa. We were sort of the younger folks that were were performing that night. And it was so meaningful to me because I saw this generation of Indigenous musician, folks like Willie Thrasher and Willie Mitchell and Eric Landry, Elanisa Bobswin, you know, people I've admired my whole life um, perform. And I sort of got to hang out backstage and visit with them and and really recognize that um, my generation of Indigenous musicians have a lot of privileges that their generation did not. We are getting a lot of recognition. We have a lot of platforms. We have a lot of grants. We have We have things that they didn't have, um, but they made music anyway. And their music was so important to our community, whether or not they ever, ever got that recognition outside of the indigenous community. So I wanted to figure out a way of, of bringing Willie's music into that gathering, even though he had passed on. And so the track that really spoke to me was I I Pity the Country because those lyrics just resonated. They just spoke to me. I felt like I could say every single one of those lines with all of my heart and mean it. And so we worked on the song and we went to, during the sound check, I remember all those old ones were in the front row crying and I was as nervous as I've ever been during a sound check because I was like, Leanne, yeah, like who do you think you are like playing like this this song of their friend and their colleague? Like how are you ever gonna do this thing justice? But they were just gentle, lovely, generous people. And then that night when we went to perform it, it was the night when the the Colton Bushy verdict came down, um, minutes before we went on stage. And it was, uh, it's a moment I'll never forget because it was like, I don't know, the energy was, had, had just been sucked out of the venue. People were just, you know, in disbelief and, um, and so upset. And I, I mean, I was sort of the next act on and I felt like I just wanted to give that audience a big hug, but also sort of honor the resistance uh, and the grieving of of the Bushy family um, and sort of everybody who had experienced this kind of violence. And so those words, I think, in that song and that performance, um, the way that we played it last that night, the way that I, I delivered the lyrics, um, I think were really influenced by by that moment. Um, and, and there were so many people actually that were in the audience that um, that I've sort of met on the journey afterwards. And so a lot of Willie's family were in the audience. Um, we got to, to meet um, his son and uh, we went and then recorded, recorded that song. Um, and I, I feel like it was a really beautiful, it was a really beautiful, meaningful thing for, for me to do. I'm really grateful to him for his work and and for that uh, for that song in particular. Yeah, I have. I, I'm feeling it in my face and in my neck hearing you describe that performance because I was at Megafono that year and I remember sitting mm-hmm. in the audience and remember just feeling the weight of it in the pit of my stomach and and thinking about what it meant to be in in this space and kind of hold the weight of that space and how 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 grateful I was that 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 there was a number of people to kind of share the knowledge of that news because I think to be to be alone um, 
would have been extremely heavy to bear. And I remember when mm-hmm. we performed and how how it it, it, it felt like um, it felt like restoring some of the energy that you know I think oftentimes when communities are going through moments of trauma like that needs to be verbalized and made really explicit on stage because it it becomes a part of the performance and it's a part becomes a part of the audience and I remember being really grateful to have seen you perform at that time so thank you for sharing that story <laughs> I mean I think on that note to sort of wrap things up you know in, in the spirit of, of, of awards and recognition and what it means for your work to be seen and appreciated what does this award mean mean to you and how does it work its way into how you think about your own work this award is 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 really meaningful to me because I think that I have not um, I've made very dis- different decisions in terms of, of my music career and in terms of making um, making music videos I've tried to um, put oftentimes emerging filmmakers first. I've told community stories. Um, the accident of being lost is it was made by a class of mine at, at the Dechinta Center for Research and Learning in the Northwest Territories. I've made very, very different decisions. And so to have, be, and because of that, I never ever expected to um, win an award or to to have anyone recognize that. And so that to me is really, really beautiful. I've, I've always tried to put that kind of creative and artistic process first. I've tried to think really carefully around ethics and politics and, and collaboration. And, um, and so it feels really, really lovely to be honored uh, with this award um, and to be seen. So miigwech. <laughs> Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Thank you for um, thank you for sort of exploring some of these questions with me via sometimes the strange world of video interviewing conferencing type things. I feel really grateful to have shared the space with you. Yeah, thank you so much. Those were amazing questions. I, I really enjoyed visiting with you. I hope I got to meet you someday in person. <laughs>